Hello! This will be a fun video for those of you that appreciate algorithms and math. We'll also be doing some basic UI which I gloss over, because the meat of this tutorial is in generating the random pixels on the screen, and finding a way in which they are more uniformly distributed. This video was inspired while I was browsing Reddit and got an under maintenance error page. Uh, so I decided, yeah, I'd, I'd like to recreate this, and yeah, that decision resulted in me spending way too much time finding a good solution to generate the blocky pixels on the screen. Um, well, to generate them in such a way that they are sufficiently random and appealing to look at. In addition to this, I wanted the pixels to move across the screen or maybe transition softly to different values. So yeah, that is where Perlin Noise or the Perlin Noise algorithm jumps in. Perlin Noise was developed by Ken Perlin in 1983 for the purpose of generating more natural appearing textures used in visual effects. For example, if you want to create a procedurally generated fire, then Perlin Noise is an algorithm you can use to generate more natural looking effects by having a more controlled random appearance. What is a controlled random appearance? For me it is easier to visualize things. So I'll be using a program called Processing to do some visual examples and I'll also refer to the book The Nature of Code by Daniel Schiffman. I'll link the webbook and Daniel's YouTube channel if you want to learn more on the topic. So let's start with something that most of us will be familiar with, and that is just using a normal random number generator. For example, if we use a random number generator to generate a value between 0 and 255, and take that value into a color spectrum, then we'll end up with something that resembles white noise. As you can see, there is no relationship between each pixel, as each pixel is being assigned a random value independently. What if we graph random numbers over time? We walk along an axis that represents a time and then randomly choose a number as we go along. Then we connect those numbers to see what pattern can be discerned. As you can see, there is no pattern and there is no smoothness. So this is why Ken Perlin won an Academy Award for the creation of the Perlin Noise algorithm. The algorithm gives us the flexibility to model randomly generated values that share a more natural appearance. Let's explore this by modeling Perlin noise. If we graph Perlin noise values over time, we will see a less random nature between each consecutive value of time, and instead see a smoothness and relationship between each value and the value next to it. Take a look at this animation of the sphere moving across the screen. Its position is being controlled by an implementation of Perlin noise. Its movement is smooth and sufficiently random. It does not feel jarring or unnatural. So let's jump back to our initial white noise example. So instead of generating the white noise by calling random, what we will do is we will generate the values using a two-dimensional Perlin noise. So let's hit run on this. And as you can see, we have a cleaner, more cloudy appearance. Um, between the individual pixels, it is a more smooth transition between one pixel to the next one. And that is the essence of um, Perlin noise. It has a more natural feel to it. Um, but there is still a level of randomness and uniqueness to it. So this is exactly what we want and this is what we will be using to generate the block pixels in our Flutter application. Before we start with the Flutter code, note that how quickly we increment over time will affect the smoothness of the noise. For example, increasing the increment value will result in a less smooth um, appearance. So instead of saying 0.01, .01, if we say 0.1 and hit run, you'll see um, it's closer to the white noise that we previously had. That is because we don't want to make significant jumps in time to get the values for the polar noise. Um, the polar noise only creates a smooth experience if we slowly increment over time as we move along its values. In addition to this, there are other values that we can control to generate the exact texture or feel that we want. These we will explore somewhat in the rest of the video. Okay, let's jump into the code. I won't go into detail how I'm generating this layout. So yeah, if you are interested, feel free to check out on GitHub um, how I'm doing this layout. I'll only be mentioning the fact that I'm setting um, or I'm wrapping the column for the text fields in a container and that container I'm also setting the color um, and I'm setting that color to be equal to the background color. The reason that I'm doing that is because um, once we actually start generating the pixels moving on the background, I don't want those pixels to be visible um, in this area where the text is. I don't want them to be showing through between each individual character. So that is why um, I'm setting it to be the same as the background. It's just a, a layer of protection. Okay, so I've proceeded to create a new file called pixel.dart. 
and currently this has a stateful widget and a custom painter and this stateful widget is receiving a color and that color we will set to be the background color and that container has a child of custom paint with another child um, that stretches um, a container across the entire screen and we achieve that by um, passing in double dot infinity for the width and the height um, something to note is for the custom painter the size is controlled by its child attribute so the, the um, width and the height that we specify here that will propagate to the parent and then the custom painter is where we will be doing all of the painting for the application that is where the individual pixels will be printed and that are moving across the screen so yeah what we want to do is instead of giving a default background we want to pass in this class so we need to jump back to main.dart and then in our home stateless widget instead of giving this fixed container we will set it to be equal to the widget Okay, a quick fast forward. Um, what we have now is we started painting the pixels. So for the custom painter, I've extended this class to contain two uh, or three different parameters. The first is the color, which we default to white, a pixel size that we default to 18, and then a block size that we initialize to be um, 1.4 uh, times the size of the pixel size. So why do we have these two separate ones? Why do we have block size and pixel size? That is because um, for the for loop that we iterate vertically and horizontally, or horizontally and vertically, um, we are iterating over the size.width divided by the block size and size.height divided by the block size. And remember, the block size is slightly bigger than the pixel size. And then within each of these um, blocks, we are painting the pixels. So that is how we get this little bit of a space between each of these pixels. And uh, we are doing the actual drawing by calling canvas.drawRect and then passing in a rect and the width and the height attributes are set to be equal to the pixel size. And then uh, um, what we're doing is we're generating a random value calling next int um, and getting a value of 255. And then we are setting the alpha property for our color. And the alpha contains the um, uh, it essentially determines how see-through the color would be. So the closer to zero, the more um, opaque, opaque it would be, and the closer to 255, the more solid the color would be. So yeah, we can do a lot better. And uh, after this, we will start implementing Perlin noise to get a more um, nicer, cleaner distribution of the random values on the screen. Okay, so we are starting to make progress. As you can see on the screen, we actually have some values that are nicely distributed. It's not exactly what we want. Um, if you remember from the um, design or the graded design that we want to copy, there are certain areas that also need to be entirely invisible. So before we do that, let's quickly run through um, how I'm incorporating this Perlin noise into the Flutter application. So the first thing to note is the fact that we are making use of a new package. So yeah, if we jump to the pubsec.yaml, you can see the differences are as follows. We are um, adding the fast noise package. And this is the dependency that we will use to generate the Perlin noise. Okay, and then jumping to the pixel.dart file, the changes are that we are importing the fast noise package and then initializing a Perlin noise attribute in the init state. We will explore the properties that we pass to it in a moment. And then within the custom paint, we are now passing in the Perlin noise, and then we have this max and min values, um, which I'll also touch on now. And then instead of generating the values randomly, now we're calling um, noise.getPerlin2, and then we're getting the two dimensional Perlin noise for the X and the Y. And then based on the value that we get, these values can be anything from, these values can be anything from the range of um, negative square square root of um, one divided by two or the max of the square root of one divided by two. Do not ask me why this is. I'm linking a article in the description if you're interested. Um, but yeah, apparently that article said that those are the um, maximum and minimum values that can be generated by Perlin noise. And then based on those max and min values, we are um, calculating a percentage. So what we're doing is we're spanning over the um, the noise value that we get, um, subtracted by the 
um, the minimum value that it can be, and then dividing over the maximum range that it could be. And then we're getting a percentage value and then uh, multiplying that with 255. And then we're doing the exact same thing. We're just um, drawing that to the screen. So if we scroll back up to the Perlin noise, as you can see, we have three attributes. We have octaves, frequency, and seed. Um, there are smarter people than me that can explain this, but what you should know is that these values essentially control the randomness or the distribution of the values um, that you will get from the Perlin noise function. Um, so these are the values that I played with, and these are the values that I found worked well for, for our needs, or at least um, for the needs of generating um, these few pixels on the screen. Um, and the seed is something we will be playing with later, and that is essentially the starting point of where you should do the generation on the entire spectrum of this uh, polar noise algorithm. So one thing that we can do is we can generate the seed value to be a random attribute or a, a random value to ensure that each individual starts up or each time we start this um, this Perlin noise function, we get a different initial value. So to achieve that, this time we will make use of the normal random function again. And now every time we save and reload the app or do a hot restart, you will see a slightly different um, configuration or a slightly different map that gets generated. Next up, a slight change in the code, but a big difference um, for the UI. As you can see, we are actually getting like um, some spots that are not no longer being generated or the pixels are no longer being filled in. Um, so all I'm doing is a simple um, check on the RGB value to see if it's uh, bigger than 144. If yes, then it actually prints the, um, or draws the rectangle. This is just to get that blocky texture. But uh, a problem that I'm having now is the fact that these are too similar in nature. As you can see, um, we are not getting a lot of variance in the different colors. So one thing that um, I found in my experience was the fact that the pillar noise never actually got close to the theoretical maximum value, which is equal to the square root of a 0 0.5, which is equal to 0 0.7. So if we um, instead set this to statically be 0 0.5, um, then the range of values are um, a lot closer to the maximum and minimum values. So if we hit save now, you can see we get a bit better distribution of the colors. Uh, at least for me, that, that is uh, visually more appealing. And from this point on, I'll be using this as a value. Okay, almost finished with the app. Um, a couple of changes. We changed the color, so it's no longer white. It's this offset um, edge yellow, whatever that color is. And then we have started doing the animation. So currently uh, the animation won't be running. I'll show you why in a second. But uh, yeah, remember to extend with single ticket provider state mixin. And then we have an animation. And this animation is said to be equal to an integer tween that stretches from one to 100. Uh, these are just arbitrary numbers that I chose just to do the sample animation and later we'll be doing a loop of this animation. And then I'm setting the duration to 100 seconds because as this is a maintenance screen, uh, uh, I don't know how long someone would look at a maintenance screen, but in theory, we want this thing to be running indefinitely. So later we will set this to be running in a loop. Um, and then within the um, container that we uh, have the custom painter, we have this wrapped in an animated builder now. And the animation is set to the scroll anim, uh, which is what we defined here. And then we have a builder which builds the custom paint. And then we're passing in the pillar noise as usual. And we're also passing in the scroll anim dot value. So this will be the integer value between one and 100. So if we jump to the noise painter, in the noise painter, we now have an X offset property. And this X offset property is what we will do to animate these pixels um, horizontally. So now within the get Perlin um, algorithm, we will say X offset plus X and hit save. And then do a hot restart to restart the animation. Now I can see we have moving pixels on the screen. And as you can see, we still get that nice uniform distribution for the values that are coming next to it. 
Okay, this is the final section. Um, in this section, we're doing a bit of a, um, a trick to get a looping animation or to make this screen infinitely um, in an animatable state. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure there might be a better way to do this. Uh, if you do know, let me know in the comments. But yeah, all I'm doing is setting a or adding a status listener that calls this looping animation function. And this checks the status to see um, if it is completed, if the animation is completed, then it just calls reverse. And if the animation status is the missed, so essentially when reverse is finished, then it will just call the controller to forward again. So as an example, let's set this to two seconds, hit save, and then do a hot restart. Then you'll see in two seconds, it will go back, two seconds, it will go forward, two seconds, it will go back again. Um, and then let's set this back to 100 because this is, will be burning through my resources. Do a hot restart. And yeah, now technically the screen will be uh, constantly moving. And then finally, in the should repaint method within the custom painter class, we are now doing a check to see if the X offset value that we pass in is the same as the previous X offset that we passed in. We're doing this as an optimization check. Before this, what we did was we returned uh, true uh, for every call to should repaint, which would result in this painter class being, or this painter method being called every single time. Um, what we want instead is we want there to be some check to make sure that the painting is actually necessary. So because of the way that the animation is currently set up, um, this should repaint method will be called uh, at certain points with the same X offset value between different calls. Um, so yeah, we just want there to be a simple check to see is this X offset different to the previous one? Should there actually be a repaint that happens? If yes, return true, and then the paint method gets called, otherwise return false. And yeah, that's that for, for this tutorial. Um, I had a lot of fun making this. Um, I can still think of some ways we can optimize this. Currently, we are running through this entire loop every single time. Uh, I guess we can store these values or store these um, RGB values for the alpha value and then just iterate through it instead of um, calling Perlin noise every single time for this iteration. But yeah, it's, it's uh, I don't think it's too expensive owing to the fact that we aren't doing that many pixels. It's only these ones that we do on the screen. Uh, I guess we can also maybe not generate the ones underneath the text over here. Yeah, or if, if you have no ways that we can um, increase the performance or make this more performant, let me know in the comments or if there's a better way that you would have done this implementation, I'd be very curious to know. Um, one thing we can definitely do is instead of using the Perlin noise uh, algorithm, we can use different algorithms that are more simplistic and um, or algorithms that actually do the same, but were invented for the purpose of the fact that uh, the Perlin noise algorithm is expensive and it is uh, computationally complex to to um, to generate these values. Uh, I think one of the algorithms is called simple noise, which was also uh, invented by Ken Perlin. So yeah, worth investigating if different algorithms would have given a better result. If you like this video, uh, give it a like. If you didn't like it, tell me why. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.